Any of y'all experience that? Any of y'all experience that with your mom's two people? She went with me to my parent-teacher conference. She was the whitest black woman y'all ever seen in y'all life. Soon as she walked in, here, how you doing? <laughs> Chastity, mom. <laughs> good to see her. She did the school good. It's <laughs> my baby. <laughs> so when she got me home, she choked me the fuck out. You hear me? <laughs> Don't you ever in your life tell that teacher nothing about what I do in my house. Chastity, stop closing your eyes like you passing out. I'm not choking you all the way. <laughs> That's Chastity Washington, um, local Milwaukee comic. Veteran, um, a veteran Milwaukee comic. She's been doing comedy for a long time, and you're you're also a teacher. You said, yes, yes, yes. And you've been a teacher since '99. '99. And you incorporate that a lot into your comedy. I do. I How'd do. that come about? Uh, I mean, you you know, your stand up is, you know, whatever you, whether you're a joke writer and you're doing this, and it's parts of your life, mm-hmm. you know, and so that is a. Um, part of my life you know mm-hmm. so and, and it's uh the experiences are hilarious on a daily basis you know do you feel like that's an easier thing to do as a comic um writing jokes about your actual life or do you think kind of making fictional bits is easier or um, do you think that comes with experience because i mean you know i for me it's always been about your life and about your experiences that's what it's been for me you know what I mean? Like, I, I can remember early in my career, we, oh, let me structure this and do this and that. But, you know, you're, you're talking about your life is your, is your life. You know what yeah. I mean? So. Because that's what I'm, I'm realizing now, um, a little over a year into comedy. Mm-hmm. And when I try talking about my life, mm-hmm. just what if it's not that funny? And I used to get a lot of crickets and like mm. bomb, <laughs> bombing on those bits. And well, I'm over I mean, here thinking my life is extremely funny because yeah, it's my yeah. life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, the this is the thing about stand up that people don't understand. Stand up is an art form. This is a craft. This is not you just up and you know you you have to. There's a process. You understand what I'm saying? There's a process. It, you may have. Um, where you know oh i think i think this is funny it's different you know you talking to your friends you sitting around with your friends and y'all laughing and talking or you sitting with your it's family not the same. no it's not you you had the you know uh we always joke about you know you it, the barbecue funny is not stand up funny mm-hmm. but the backyard funny uh is not always stand up funny mm-hmm. so it the stand up is a craft it is a art form and you have to put in the work in developing um, what you know your material is going to be, and your perspective, and your voice, and so it's it's truly a craft. It's art form. What is it that a one would need in their everyday life? Like, how can one notice know they have potential at stand up comedy in their everyday life? Like, obviously, with other arts, if you're a good singer, you know you're a good singer. If mm-hmm. you're a good um rapper you know you're a good rapper if you're a good actor you know you're a good actor because you've done it you've seen yourself on film or you've heard yourself on the track Mm -hmm. but how does a comic know that they could potentially be funny on stage if there's no outlet for them to know that because you can sing in the shower and know you can sing you can rap in front of your friends and know you can rap but as to your point it's not the same as joking amongst your friends yeah so how would you know you have potential to be a stand-up comedian well you have to do it you have to do it, and then um, you have to do it in different capacities. Um, like we were just talking about, you did this show, and you did this show, but then you have to do another show, and then you have to do another show, and you have to do a different audience and a different audience, and then this, and then work this thing and work this thing, and this, did, did this work again? Did this work? You understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you could go and be, you mentioned um, um, uh, rounding third, you know, okay, it, it may do this at Rounding Third and do something else at Bremen and do something else in another place. Mm-hmm. So that is the, the, the gauge is, is, is you getting up and doing those, those, um, um, those sets mm-hmm. and, and seeing, because you have to feel your way th- through things, even with, with new material, you have to feel your way through. You have to figure out if this is funny and then tweak it and change it. 
or throw it away and start and do and write something else. You understand what I mean? So yeah. Mm-hmm. And speaking of new material, it just it's unfortunate. It sucks at with stand up comedy that that's the only art form where you have to practice new material in front of an audience. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the toughest things that are about it because like with music with acting you mm-hmm. get to do it in the privacy amongst yourselves and maybe your your um the people on the same song that are with you your mm-hmm. cast castmates whatever the case may be mm-hmm. but with stand up mm-hmm. you got to embarrass yourself and look stupid <laughs> in front of other people <laughs> to figure out yeah, what you works gotta, you got to figure out what you got to figure that out what advice would you give to people who are in that situation um to you have to do the work there is no like you just up and just, you can't cheat. There's no cheating the game or the process. Mm-hmm. So you have to do the work, you know, if, if that makes sense. And what's the work? The work is you, you going in and developing material and doing sets and, and not even necessarily where you're, you're booked and, oh, I'm doing shows. You, you have to work material. Mm-hmm. You have to work, you have to work an open mic or do a showcase set or do a guest set and, and work that the, those things you got to work those things what got you into comedy what inspired you um you know what i was always it, it comedy found me first of all and i always tell people mm. it found me i didn't i didn't find comedy yeah i didn't i didn't pursue where i was like oh i want to be a comedian it didn't happen like that stand up found me like even when i was in high school people said hey, you know you should do stand up you should you know and I would be like, I don't know. Even though I was always an avid fan of stand up, even from the time I was a kid, I watched yeah. stand up. I watched things that were funny and people that were funny. Um, so I was always a fan, but I was never interested in like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna be a comedian. I was that wasn't it, that wasn't it for me. Right? Was it in your family uh, stand up comedy? No. Is it something that you're like you no. saw uh, uncle, dad, mom no. watching? No. Yeah, I mean, I, people would watch it, and I, I watched it. I would, I would sneak off and watch um, stand-up specials. I would, I remember watching, sneaking and watching a Richard Pryor special. You yeah, know, live on Sunset everybody Street, has that story. You know, at two o'clock in the morning, I'm every sleep, comedian has like, that I'm, story. I'm on the floor with, you know, and, and uh, I'm, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. Yeah. And Turning it down when it gets it down, high. Right? Yeah. And so, yes. Yeah, so, and I watched everybody. Uh-huh. I watched everything. I watched, you know, from from Roseanne Barr. I remember seeing Ellen DeGeneres when I was a kid. I would, you know, sneak it. I would steal my cousins. She had tapes. Like, she had, you know, she had money and whatever. So, I would, like, cop her tapes and listen to, um, she had, like, Eddie Murphy Comedian, like, the album. I remember listening to it on the way to school. I was sneaking in with my headphones on. Mm. And that's what I was listening to. You know what I mean? Um, and this is many, many years before YouTube. And this is, you yeah, know, whatever. And, um, I mean, I watched Bill Cosby himself religiously. Right? And just everything. All of that. They would do young comedian showcases on HBO. And, you know, especially in the 80s. I, you know, I, all of that. So I was just... A fan. I was a fan of stand up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How has um, comedy changed mm-hmm. since you were growing up watching it to now? Um, I think it's it's changed um, in the scale of people that do it. Mm. Um, because in the past, um, you had a certain amount of, of comics and um, tried and true comics. The 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 way that people uh, receive stand up is different. You you know you there were you know a couple vehicles. You either you got on TV. You got a special. If you got on TV, you got on Carson. You know the Late Show. This is and this is you know eighties and then into the nineties. It transitioned into the Def Jam era. You know, um, Martin Lawrence, Martin Lawrence, you know, Def Jam was the explosion of he was the um, man back then. Oh, my God. Yeah. But he earned it. He He had Def Jam. He had the Martin show and he was the top stand up comedy. He was just a dude. Absolutely. It was it was lightning in a bottle. It was lightning. It was so funny. But it was what, you know, everybody was a catalyst for everybody else. So, you know, Gregory and Bill Cosby were catalysts for 
Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor was a catalyst for Eddie Murphy. Murphy. Eddie Murphy was the catalyst for Martin Lawrence and then Chris Rock. And right. And then now it's, you know, and then the, the Def Jam opened the door for the Kings and the Queens of comedy and, and, and all of, you know, the, um, so, so many comedians, comic view. And I was blessed to get the opportunity to do comic view. I saw that two times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, so comic view in the, you know, early nineties and, and, you know, all of those comics that we saw from the D.O. Hughley's to the Sedgwick Entertainers to, you know, Steve Harvey to, you know, and we saw them on Def Jam. And then, you know, that brought the Bill Bellamy's and the Chris Rock's. And yeah. so, I mean, not Chris Rock, but Chris Tucker, you know. Um, so it just, it was such a catalyst. So it changed and it exploded. It just exploded. And then um, the, the, the growth and development of Comedy Central and now it's at a you know a, a different place than where it was like uh -huh. twenty years ago. So, so yeah, so it, it's changed. It's the way that um, people receive stand up. They can receive it on some. You can stream everything. You can you know net, the Netflix special. The it went from the you know top tier was HBO, and then Netflix took that over. You really? Know what I mean, yeah. HBO. It was it was about getting an HBO special. It was this. Oh, Back at a certain past. time, eighties, nineties, nineties, early two thousands, and then it, it transitioned. And then what about Comedy Central? Over. And Comedy Central too. That's why I said really because I was. Yeah. I'm not surprised that getting an HBO special was the was the motive in the eighties mm -hmm. and nineties. Mm -hmm. I was I was shocked that it just went from HBO to Netflix. I thought there was a Comedy Central yeah, era Comedy in Central, between. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and they're, they're like getting a comedy specials, the half hour special. Having, getting yeah. a half hour special. And then going from that half hour special to the HBO special. Got you. That's the, that was the the you know the pattern. Or before. Showtime maybe. Um. Yeah, but not not so. Showtime wasn't known so much for their stand up. But then as everybody started to develop divisions, of course, then it became everybody got had stand up. Yeah. So you know it changed over the years. Yeah. Do you think it's um, easier or harder? than it was to get a special? Um, I don't, I mean, now because people develop their own content, they, they don't have, there's no, you don't have to go through, you don't have to, you know, um, you can do your own at this point. So you can prove that you're funny instead of having to wait before somebody can give you the opportunity to prove to them. Yeah. Because you needed to actually have an op Okay, now is your opportunity to prove to me. But now you can actually just set you up your own camera, book your own show, and, like, create your own special. And yeah. if it's funny, clearly people are laughing on camera. Clearly mm -hmm. people are liking it mm -hmm. on social media and commenting. So mm -hmm. it's there's evidence. It's different now. Uh-huh. And, di and then it's, it's different ways that comedians promote themselves and, you know, um, with podcasts and sketch shows and, yeah. and sketches and, and just reels. And, you know, people use uh, social media in all different types of ways. You see the, some the, the internet sensations, the comedians that you see have, that have really um, gotten huge, you know, from using their social media. Yeah, Rogan, is, Joe Rogan is a fantastic, are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. He's a good example. Mm -hmm. His comedy, stand-up comedy at least, it wasn't anything crazy like mm -hmm. he was a known comic like people went to his shows mm -hmm. but as his show grew mm -hmm. his comedy career grew like sometimes you don't even have to be and let me ask you this question too for a comic who's seen the eras change mm -hmm. sometimes you don't even have to be that funny to be booking and selling shows mm -hmm. for a comic who's seen that era change right before her, her eyes how does that make you feel uh, i mean it's 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 part of what it what it is. It's not like a knock on the art or anything because I know some um, comedians who've seen that, who've seen the era change. They don't appreciate that because like mm -hmm. they feel like the people who are actually putting in the work, the people who actually put it in the talent, might not necessarily get the result. It's not necessarily who works hard, who's who's the funniest. It's about who has the most social media followers now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. You know what? My main objective is to continue to be consistent and do what I'm called to do. Yeah. I, I can't be concerned about about that because if that's what they're doing, that's great. That's great for them. Mm -hmm. Do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I've seen all kind of folks, you know, um, folks that, but I know that there's a learning curve, 
there's a learning curve, um, especially if they are not necessarily stand-ups and they do you know funny skits or funny characters or whatever. So they have to get that learning curve because then it's okay. People, you got you know however many followers, and then you get go to cities and you sell out clubs, and then you have to give them a show. Yeah. So and that goes to your point that um, a lot of times. I just feel like they're not, they get pushed to, with the social media era, sometimes a lot of comedians, they're not ready for the platform they have Mm. because they're, they're just, they're pushed to a stage before they even have the material. Mm -hmm. There's a guy, um, he's actually a friend of Rogan's. His name is uh, Brendan Schwab. He was um, an MMA, he did MMA and he was doing podcasting. Mm. And then he started a um, stand-up career. And within two years, he starts touring. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and okay. the guy is not good. Like, he gets shredded online for not being funny. Well, yeah, he's started comedy two years ago. Like, he <laughs> just, like, that's a perfect example. Yeah. I feel like it's 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 happening right now, but eventually a lot of comedians will learn the hard way. Like, just because you have the social media following doesn't mean you need to start booking shows all over the country. Mm -hmm. Like, you can, you could go to open mics like everybody else did for, like, five years, like, work on your craft. You don't have to necessarily be the man right away. Mm -hmm. It's just that instant gratification era, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, that they're also, they're not going to turn down if if somebody offers this type of opportunity. So it's easier said than done while I'm over here talking. (laughs) (laughs) They're not, you know, they're not going to be like, hey, we want to, you know, we'll give you development. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. You know. I don't think I'm ready. I'm sorry. No, (laughs) no, I'm not ready. Let me frag you. No, no, I don't. You go ahead and keep that million dollars. You said, what, two million? I don't want it. You take it back. I I don't think that's how it works. No, that's not, they're not going to. You That's know, valid. You know, they're not. So, yeah. You know, but I respect it. I respect it because they're, they're doing, that's what they're doing. So, so I guess you just, because it's possible. Um, I was watching Marlon Wayne's mm-hmm. on The Breakfast Club, um, mm-hmm. I think a few days ago. Mm-hmm. And he was actually explaining kind of what I just explained. So mm-hmm. because of the family he came from, he even admitted, he was like, yeah, we do nepotism. My family does nepotism. Like, mm-hmm. that's what it is. Like, who cares? He even explained, like, like yeah, I got a ch- shot when I was 19. I wasn't that funny. I wasn't ready. I just got the shot because Keenan Ivory Waynes is my brother. Mm-hmm. And he admitted. Mm-hmm. But, like, he was like, now I'm about to be, I'm 50 years old. And he's like, I'm mad funny. Have you seen my stuff lately? Mm-hmm. So, like, what I'm saying is he grew in the eyes of the public. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's what's going to be the new thing is, like, people, comedians are going to be growing in the eyes of the public in terms of stand-up, and that's just going to be socially acceptable. I suppose. As as before, like, you had to be ready. Yeah, I mean, you know, like again, and you asked about how it changes. Like, you had to earn, you know, um, you had to earn your, your five minutes. You had to earn your three minutes. You had to develop it however you had to develop it. And that's it. why I asked. That has to you be to annoying. Yeah, you could, it, there was no like, in the past, you know, it's, uh, especially here in Milwaukee, it was different. You know, now there's a, a thriving scene uh, in so many places. You can go somewhere, you know, just about every night of the week. Um, but in the past, you had to, man, you had to earn that three minutes and get 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 a guest set somewhere. You had to, no. Yeah. It didn't work like that. You just didn't, you know, there, there was, you know, maybe two open mics. I remember we had four clubs here at one point. Excuse me, in the early 90s. And, in Milwaukee? Mm-hmm. Mm. Excuse me. And um, they had a, a regular running, consistent open mic at, at the Safe House. Um, um, years ago, Lord, Lord bless Tony Miller. He was uh, a national headliner and working th- at the Comedy Cafe. That was an amazing club here for 30-some-odd years. Mm. And... Um, one of the few black comics that that worked there, and he hosted this op- this open mic, and it was like every Thursday night, you know, um, and yeah, and then that would catalyst to get you into other other things or other mics, you know, whatever. But you had to earn that. You had to work that that time. Mm-hmm. You had to earn. You had to be funny to get the time. It wasn't just it wasn't just handed to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you had to. Uh, I know that's a thing in Los Angeles a lot at the comedy store. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. back in the 80s and the 90s and 70s too, prior to that also, you couldn't just sign up for open mic and get on stage. Like, you had to earn open mic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you had to go there, keep signing up, and you wouldn't get on. But when you do get on, mm-hmm. and if you're not funny, mm-hmm. probably not getting on again. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was brutal back then. Mm-hmm. Different. Whereas now, like I said, the influx is so many more comedians now, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Yeah. So then it's, you know, then it's now you got, you know, you get go somewhere and and write your name on the list and it's the first 20 and, you know. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. have you seen a decrease in crowd um, and audience members over the years? No. 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 That shocks me. I figured, like, maybe in the 90s, there will be more people at open mics No, I didn't that were know in the that. audience because there wasn't oh, as many mean, things competing for their attention. Oh, you mean, like, like audiences at open mics? Is yeah. Is that what you're saying? Oh, not, okay. Not comics. I'm, I would think it's even increased, oh, the, the amount of like comics, at, people at trying at to be shows, comedians. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, like, no, it's a it's a burst now because people need it after coming out of the, the, the pandemic. Um, okay. Um, you know what? I can't, I can't say, cause I've been to some amazing open mics and then I've been to open mics where it's three people like regular people. And then it's just comics, yeah. you know what I mean? So, uh, and, 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 and some of them, it depends on the mic. Some mics are, are really dope and they have full audiences. And then some of them are, you know, Oh, it's, this is karaoke night. They just here waiting to sing. You know, or they came out, they didn't know it was a show tonight. You know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it kind of varies. So I can't really say. I can't say. Did you see the uh, Chris Rock special? I did. You did? What you think about I it? I did. I enjoyed it. I, I haven't enjoyed gotten... it. It was like classic Chris Rock to yeah. me. Yeah. It was, it was classic Chris Rock. I watched about the first 20. I haven't gotten to the full thing yet. I enjoyed it. I thought it was funny. I, I liked um, his... Um, Description about him being single and older and, you know, it, it was classic. I think I saw that bit when he was talking about why he likes to date younger women. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Shoes, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Hilarious. Like, yeah, yeah, it was classic Chris Rock. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were upset about it again. Yeah, they, you know, I don't know. I don't know why people, it didn't bother me. I like this- what he said. So he said what he said, and I, I don't, I, I didn't take offense to any of it. I don't, Has- I don't know. Has that always been the case? What? People getting upset at comedians? Is this a relatively newer thing? Or has this always been there? The is internet it, just didn't exist many years ago. We're yeah, just seeing I mean, it now. It wasn't. This is the thing. People are. The, the, I don't know. The internet is people, you know, the social media and uh, people are cynical and critical and they have keyboard courage Keyboard courage. And, um, yeah. And then it's like people so deeply feel like they, they have, you know, they got to share their opinion, what they think. And it, ugh, come on. Like, I don't know. To me, I, I'm not. I, 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 he said what he said. I don't see where it was offensive. I don't see where there was anything wrong with it. Yeah. It was something that happened. And then people don't understand that there's a process. To, even though he shot the special live, he probably has been developing the material for a year since all of that happened with the Oscars last year. Yeah. So he said what he said. He told the story and what else? Like, how you going to tell us? I, I saw somewhere somebody was like, well, it's over. Why are you still talking about it? Because it happened to him. Yeah. So I it's don't something know. People that happened. Are, the, 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 the common sense sometimes. He got slapped in front of millions. Exactly. That's traumatizing. It is. And let him <laughs> talk about it how he need to talk about it. That you have no control over um, other people. Yeah. And it's almost I don't I don't understand that but And honestly, I don't think uh Chris Rock was mad enough. Mm-hmm. Cuz you got to realize what happened. He got slapped and I this happened a year ago and I'm so sick of talking about it, but we're talking about the Netflix special. Mm-hmm. And he got slapped in front of millions of people. That's traumatizing. Mm-hmm. Very much so. We don't but we also don't have control over what his response was. His response was what it was. Exactly. He said how he felt. He explained, hey, I didn't do anything. That wasn't my fault. That wasn't even about, it wasn't about. It wasn't about it wasn't. Chris. I, I, that's personally how I, I yeah. thought about it. That didn't have any, even though in the moment, whatever, he that was, was a high. Scapegoat. Yeah. 
that was a high pressure moment for Will. Mm-hmm. And whatever the dynamics between him and, you know, Jada, like I, I tell folks all the time, Jada is a rich white woman at this point. <laughs> okay? So we don't know the Why dynamics. Why you say that? She's a rich white woman at this point. But Will has more power than her, though. Yeah. But Oh, so he's a rich white man at this point, too. He's still who he is, but she's a rich white. She she lives the life of a rich white woman at this point in her life. Okay. Right? And we don't know the dynamics of their relationship or what else was going on. And this cat is finally, after four or five nominations, finally about to get his first Oscar. Right? And maybe he felt disrespected. So or... we don't know what was going going on in there and so i guess what that didn't have nothing to do chris just was he just happened to say it was because it wasn't that far to go it, was, it wasn't that hard he didn't hit her that hard you know word wise he said something and it was, <laughs> it was funny but it, it's not in out of the ordinary for yeah. what chris does chris you know and um and he's great at he's great he's been great you know that didn't have nothing to do with chris and his reaction to it, he said it, and that's it. Do you feel like that kind of opened up a can of worms for a community, um, a culture that retaliates towards things that comics say? Because here's something I've realized. Mm-hmm. I've noticed that a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people tend to, they don't look at stand-up comedy as a legitimate art. Some people don't. They just see it as a person up there talking stuff talking stuff on talking shit on stage, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Like, well, anybody can be funny. You're not actually doing anything. Mm-hmm. So if you do something that offends them, they feel the need to speak out about it. Like, if something offends you in a movie, people, they speak out about it, but it's never as boisterous, as loud as when people get offended by a comedian. Have yeah, you noticed it's, that? Yeah. It's because, like, people respect the art form of a movie or it's just a film, but you can't respect the art form yeah, of a set. Like, it's a, it's a right. comic comedy but, set. But it's also because they're standing right there in front of you, right? They're physically there with you if you're at a show. Yeah. And it, it, I think it did. You know, I've heard stories from other comic friends of mine of, you know, right after that happened, it kind of gave folks the license to feel like that they could do whatever instead of respecting the constructs of a of a show. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I also think we are in an age and in the middle of a generation where people are very sensitive and very touchy and ready and quick to take offense to things that they could possibly, you know, brush off their shoulder. Do you feel like that goes and comes? Um, I, I, I can't say cause this, I've never seen this height of offense, but that's, <coughs> but social media makes a difference. Hmm. Social mix, social media makes a difference because people can finally speak out and say, "Well, I feel like this about everything." I thought it was pretty bad in the eighties. Like no. PC culture was kind of up there too in the eighties. No, it was. I mean, no, it was. It wasn't. We the some of the stuff that's on you know television that it was on the tel- on television then it there was a different compass too. There's a different compass, and people are touchy now. People are sensitive. People are easily offended. Um, and, you know, and it, it's a PC culture, yeah. you know? Um, and, yeah. What so, do you think creates that? Um, what creates Just from your worldview, not even looking at it as a, as a comic, what's created that PC culture? Um, it, it, you know, some of it is, it's a, a, a myriad of different things. It's not just like, oh, it was just this one thing. Some of it has been because um, pe- things have been disrespected in so many ways over the years. Like, you know, um, standing for, for women's rights or respect for people uh, uh, that are um, multicultural or diverse or, you know, people with disabilities, people that are LGBTQ, you know, like that. the, the, the change for good in terms of respecting people as a whole. So there's an overcorrection. Um, but then it, it, it some of it goes over. Overcorrection, you know, over yeah. Even beyond those things, then it becomes other things, and you know. And so people are just, you know, overly touchy and, and, and sensitive, mm-hmm. you know, in, in some things. Some things, you, you know, you have, you, all of us have a right to, mm-hmm. to, 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 to speak out against, you know, things that are not right, um, 
but some things you 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 don't have to take it as far as it, it goes. Do as you, it's gone. Do you try to consider that when you um are working on a routine and creating an act? Um for me I I really just um I try to be considerate uh of, of folks, but when it comes down to it for me it's about what am I trying to get out? Mm-hmm. Because there's still always um, it's done in love. It's done in, in purpose and in love. It's about giving joy. You, you understand what I mean? It's not shock value. It's not for anything other than to to give people joy. You're not looking to bully. You're looking to no. or harass. You're just looking to no. laugh together and have a good yeah. time. Yeah, that's because that's what it's about. Because people people need joy. People need joy. Do you feel like maybe as comedians? Um, as comedians, we may have created some of that problem ourselves by forgetting to remind people that this is about like being happy together. This is about um being in the moment and sharing mm-hmm. laughs, yeah. As opposed to, oh, I'm just gonna bully down on this guy and talk right. shit about this person that's that's fucking right. up in life right now. Right, but it, at the same time, people don't um always look at. Okay, I'll give you an example. When you are given, when you have a gift, you have a talent, whatever it is, God gives us talents and gifts for us to share those gifts in service to other people. Mm. So um, when you use it and do it that way for your own buildup, it is going, you know, you might, you know, put, put some punches on some people. Because okay. you're doing it for that reason, and you know, for yourself, for the buildup of yourself. I got you. Right? Like, so, like, like I said, we all have gifts in service of other people. You do not get an amazing uh, singing voice, like a, a, a Whitney Houston voice for Whitney Houston. Mm-hmm. Whitney Houston didn't sing for her. Mm-hmm. She sang for us and millions of other people to be blessed by. Mm-hmm. When people are writers, when people are authors, and I don't care what you do. I don't care if you fix plumbing. That's a service that blesses other people, right? And so that way, if people keep that in mind and, and die to themselves, it's not about, like, because cause what, what happens, it gets into the, the grandiose of, I'm, I'm, look at me, you know? Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> when... That's not what it's about. When you God, become God an is, entertainer. Yeah. Well, not just entertain. Anything you do. Anything you do. You're, you, you're blessed to get to do it. And then you do it in service to other people. God has blessed you with those gifts. Mm-hmm. You, didn't, you didn't give yourself that. But you've been blessed with that. That's a gift that's been given to you. That's a very humble way to look at it. It is. You had that, that, but in, when it comes down to it, right? How if do you, you, if you have a If you have a knack to... Like if you're a mechanic, right, and you just, and, and people that you know do work in different fields, I don't care what you do, and you have a knack for that thing, it was it's in you. You didn't you can you can develop that that gift, but it was still in you. That's still a gift, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. How do you continue to have that mindset throughout your career? I mean, it's pretty easy. Like we were just talking about how you do shows at the Laugh and Tap all the time. That's a very nice club. Like I work all over the country. I ain't go, and you work all over the country, yeah, but even for God. me, I ain't gonna lie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I was over here selling shows at the Laugh and Tap, I'll be feeling myself some type of way. You know, I'll be smelling myself a little bit. But like, how do you continue having that humble mindset, knowing that there are people who respect your art so much that they're willing to spend their hard earned money to come out and see you? I'm so grateful. Mm-hmm. Um, that's such a blessing because I, um, you know, and this is my, you know, you gotta think about, it. I started in 1994. Okay. Um, and it's God's grace for me. It's God's grace. Everything that I've been able to do and continue to do and the things that are coming is all God's grace. It's not, you know, like I, I work and I grind, but it's God, it's God's blessing. It's his grace. I didn't, that ain't got anything to do with me, right? I can't, you know, I made myself on Comic View, Def Jam. Yeah. That was God's blessing. That was his grace. 
You said you were on Def Jam? Yes. How was that? It was amazing. Yeah? It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Comic viewer Def Jam. So let me ask you this. What's the difference between um, a regular show, people coming out to see you at a local comedy club, Mm -hmm. as opposed to a televised situation like Def Jam and Comic View? Uh, I mean, well, it's a, it's a television show. There are television shows, there's productions, there's audiences, the, um, there's, you know, full-scale everything, you know, that you would have, you know, with, it's, it's tech and it's, it's, it's lighting and it's sound and it's, you know, and then you come in um, and you, you, you know, you're there. You know, I t- did my first, um, first time on Comic View was in 2001. Um, I remember taping you know, my first TV oh, taping, dang. and um, went down to New Orleans b- b- before Katrina, and Bruce Bruce was the host that season, and um, had my little outfit, and you know I had you know put put a a real tape together and sent it to uh, I think the producer's name was Sydney McCurdy, uh, and sent it to her for friends of mine out of Chicago helped me cut the tape up this is back when you, you know you had to submit yeah. a tape yeah, yeah. You, you know it wasn't no reels and it wasn't links it wasn't Man. YouTube it wasn't none of that the and, hustle was real yeah and uh, went down there and there were comics from all over the country and uh, I got to tape that that afternoon and it was amazing and set you know was all there they, they give you the show schedule they sit you down you know, your call time, you go in, you, you know, go in and, 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 and do your set and groan. And How crazy is that? Like being on set, getting ready to do your set, mm-hmm. and you know you're about to be on BET, a mm-hmm. channel that you watch all the time. Was, was that a surreal moment? It was surreal. It was surreal. And the Def Jam was extremely surreal. Oh, the Def Jam the was Def probably Jam crazy. The Def Jam was absolutely a dream come true. That solidifies it, it for you. Yeah. And, it, and I mean, and I've had... So many more, and it's like you know, I'm just so grateful. I just thank God for everything. Martin was no longer the host at this no, point. Right? No, no, this was um, in 2007 when I got a chance to tape, and um, we were in Los Angeles at the Orpheum Theater, um, and it was Dio Hughley was the host that year, Kid Capri, uh, and they were bringing the show back. Um, so it was amazing. It was amazing to be in the room with everybody that you saw from Def Jam and from Comic View. And so it was awesome to be there. It was almost overwhelming for me being that young. And um, But it was an amazing experience. I got a chance to, to meet Mr. Simmons and uh, Mr. Russell Simmons. And it was amazing. There's another, um, sh- it was either Stars or Showtime mm-hmm. um, produced it. There was another... Um, comedy show mm-hmm. that kind of got was kind of a rival to Def Jam mm-hmm. at the later end, right? Um geez, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't think of it right now. Cuz I'm sure there'd be a lot of those shows at at a certain point, yeah. Are you familiar with a guy named Leon Rogers? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. So I did an internship. The Destin, Destin the Legend. The Legend, Leon Rogers. One of the baddest, baddest mm-hmm. dudes. One of the baddest dudes I've known. The, um, Leon Jeez, 20 years. 20 years? Mm-hmm. You guys came up, he came up in Chicago, right? Yeah. Has there always been kind of um, um, a networking relationship between Milwaukee and Chicago comics because they're really close? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. I, I have really close relationships with so many comedians. Yeah, there still is. I do today, yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So many comedians. So many. They have a great, great scene. Especially because we both also meet up in Madison too. Yeah, that's a thing now. Was it always been a thing? Um, I think. Well, I can't say because I just I was not until recently. Um, you know, up, up at uh, Comedy on State until okay. until the recent years. Um, but I, I'm sure that there were connections. You know, over the years. Have I, you? You know, I just I know from me working through Chicago for you know the last 15 years. You know, God blessed to work with all these amazing, amazing, you know, comics. Mm-hmm. So, and yeah. back to the question I asked earlier, but the uh, difference between doing comedy on a set, like a TV show set, as mm-hmm. opposed to um, a regular show. I mean, there are is some- there is there anyone that's easier, or is it 
the same thing. Um, I mean, it's, I figured it, a TV set might be a little easier. Well, no, I mean, it, it's about the same because it's still a show. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is the you know the, the the bells and the whistles. There's so much going on. There's so many moving parts, um, and you still have to do your thing, you know, with this audience and with this crew and with this you know whatever. Um, and sometimes you have to like I was uh, I got blessed to get to do the comedy underground. Um, on the um, Urban Movie Channel, um, mm-hmm. and uh, back in 2015, and there was a moment where they were sound cut at the end of my set, so I had to exit and then come back out and do the closing. Well, not the whole the bit, but just they had to get the shot, you know. So it's still TV, you know. Um, but yeah, what was your um? I had mentioned I had asked about Martin earlier. It was Martin a big influence of yours? Because I know um, a lot of comics really, coming up in the '90s were influenced by yeah, Martin. Yeah, yeah, I, I loved Martin. Not only Martin, but um, in Living Color. Mm. In Living Color was such. A, I mean, of course, in an you SNL. Can do what you want to do. Come on, <laughs> right? And um, yeah, absolutely. They, they, again, lightning in a bottle. Uh huh. Lightning in a bottle with in Living Color having. You know, bringing that uh, that brand of urban sketch comedy to that was rival. on Fox, right? It was on Fox when Fox the was switch, new. The switcheroo of of Fox, Come a on. network. It started off so black, and I was like Absol- almost anti black. Absolutely, <laughs> the switcheroo was crazy. <laughs> yeah, and Martin living so, seriously. It was, oh yeah, because that's what sold. That's what worked, mm. and it was and it was successful. It was truly successful. It was so funny and so good. So it was competing with BET almost. Well, I mean, everybody didn't have cable. Got so you. people had cable, but then there were people that did not. It's BET not, was cable. Yeah, BET's cable. And um, and it, especially at that time. So to have that on network television was fantastic. You, you see, nowadays, we don't even, like my era, we don't even know, like, the difference between analog and cable. Somebody was, um, somebody said something to me the other day and um they were like i can't watch that because um i don't have cape no they said um they're like it's on cable and i'm like what do you mean is on cable isn't everything cable no and then he had explained <laughs> to me like i was i thought everything that was on tv with the remote was cable he'd explain to me like oh. no there's some channels like fox nbc pbs that like those, those are, are standard those are standard uh, you know, digital channels or analog. What I thought television. was cable was Fox, PBS, NBC, nope. BET, nope. and nope. then the additional cable was sub- which was called subscription was mm-hmm. HBO mm-hmm. Stars. Like that's what right. I understood. And those, right, and those are the premium channels. Gotcha. But all of the your basics, your HGTV, your BET, your MTV, those are basic cable, and, and then, they all and they always yeah, pretty I'm, much have been. I remember how it was brought up. Um, I'm a journalist. I work for PBS. Mm -hmm. And then I was telling somebody I don't get to watch my stories because I don't have cable. Like, I use internet. I stream everything I watch. Right. And they're like, "Um, PBS isn't cable. You can get that on regular TV. Channel 36. Mm, I'm like, yep. I'm like, um, yeah. I'm like, what do you mean I can get that on regular TV? Like, I don't have regular TV. Xfinity. I thought regular TV was like, Cable. Regular cable, but that's no, no. not the um, no. premium stuff. He was like, no, just get an antenna, and plug it into plug your it in. I'm like, wait, what? what <laughs> and then that like that blew my mind. Yeah. So that just kind of reminded me yeah. like there was a whole generation that I was ne- I didn't necessarily see. I yeah. was born in 1998. Wow. So I saw the a, a transition, but it wasn't the full transition. Yeah. Is, is what I. You got to think that about day. man. Like, we got cable, and thank God for cable. Mm-hmm. We got cable in 86. So we had, you had four channels. You had four channels. So you had Channel 4 here in Milwaukee's NBC, Channel 6, um, Channel 12, Channel 18, and Channel 24. And 24, you had to do with the double dial on the UHF. You had to do the zero and then the one at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And that's what that was it. That's crazy. That's it. That's the good old days when people used to actually like watch cable. When people just watch TV, it was when regular. People used to TV. watch TV regular. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we like I said, we didn't get cable. Like people had, um, 
that HBO, which was home box office, which is a box that you used to put on the back of your television and plug into the, the antennas and pl- underneath. And that's how you got HBO. You bought the box, right? And yeah. paid the subscription. Um, and then we finally got cable. And then, of course, you know, however many years ago, um, they did the switch to digital because it was still analog. It was still analog. People still dial and whatever. And yeah. then you could just go like, this is what you're saying? Yeah. No, they, it was still analog where it wasn't, um, you know, the, the, the format was different. The, the format of the, the of what you saw on a regular television was, was analog still. It was still equated. It wasn't digital like what we watch now. Oh. So they, in maybe 2011, everybody had to switch over. Of course, all the TVs. Oh, were now, I right? remember that. You I remember, remember that. that? You couldn't use antennas anymore. Something yeah. like that. Well, you still use an antenna, but the, the televisions changed. They, the, and the, the feed that networks sent out, the PBSs, the, the local stations, mm-hmm. the, you know, the Fox 6 and, and, you know, WISN 12 here, mm-hmm. Channel 58, right, CBS, the feed became digital instead of analog feed. So it, it transitioned. So then, then the televisions changed. So now all the televisions are digital. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So it could be more compatible with like what we see on screen on TV. Yes. I mean on our laptops exactly. and phones. Right. Because it, the, the, the what was uh, being produced when it was transitioning. This is before, you know, uh, 4K and and whatever. What was happening? It was you know then it was. Flat screens. Yeah. People still had big booty back TVs. You know what I'm <laughs> yeah, about? I remember that. Yeah. Okay. You had a TV mm-hmm. with two. With the that's crazy. So that's back. why they changed. Yeah, because the it, it the, the the process was now the cameras were now digital. The Word. process it, it all upgraded. So they had to, everybody had to make the transition. Word. Yeah. And then as everything grew, now everybody's streaming everything. I didn't realize that. Look at. You. I, I'm I don't even know that you're teaching me stuff about my industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think but those about are, those are the good old days when yeah. people used to watch TV though. When people rented videos, uh-huh. right? People it went from tapes to 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 um, to DVDs, and then DVDs are obsolete because every film you need is streaming. And you recognize like people used to watch TV. You recognize news reporters. Yeah. I I remember when I got into news, I thought people were going to recognize me. Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody recognized me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be going out looking at everybody, hoping somebody's right. saying nothing. Like now you work for. Like PB- you don't stop looking at me. You work P- for PBS, yeah. right? So where where are you at? Where are you primarily? Are you on Channel Ten? Channel Ten. Okay. Do you have a show on Channel Ten? I'm on Black Nouveau. Oh, okay, great. Oh, mm-hmm. I watched that like last week. I watched okay. it on like Sundays. Which show? Did, which episode did you watch? Oh my goodness! I, it was. Um, they were doing. They were remembering. Um, the 1968 riots, um, after King's death and the march, and it 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 caught my attention because I I know many of the people that they interviewed, and I got a chance. They talked about Father Grappi, who was uh, a part of um, the process, the 200 nights of walking across the bridge, um, the 16th Street Bridge. My mom told me stories about it. I remember, it, and I was just so fascinated, you know. Um, okay. And one of the club owners, Mr. Prentice. Um, who I know in that capacity was um, a part of that. And he was being interviewed. And I was like, oh, my God, this Prentice. And, and who's the host? Who's the host? Earl Arms. Okay. Okay. And formerly Joan Williams. Joanne Williams. Joanne Williams. Yes. And she was an anchor here for many years. And then formerly uh, Faith Colas, who was a good friend of mine, was a, was a host years back yes. on, on Black Nouveau. I mean, okay, it's good it, to know some yeah, people watch this show. Oh yeah, I love Black Nouveau. No, I know it's like it's a historic show here in Milwaukee. Absolutely. I just didn't think yeah. people still like watched it like yes, that. People, but I'm yes, sure I'm they yes, do. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's good yeah. to know. I gotta get my. I, I filmed the episode Black Nouveau in 2010. Really? Yeah. I could find that. I need to find. I need that footage. I'll holler at somebody for you in the next. Yeah, yeah. I need that footage, man. Just remind me. But yes, yes, Miss Chassie Washington, thank yes. you so much for coming on my show. Thank you. It's an incredible honor. I'm a big fan of yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching another episode of the Greatly Destined Podcast, episode 12. See you guys. Thank you, Chassie.
Thank you. That was good.